evaporation is a major flux of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Each year, about 75 petagrams of carbon enter the atmosphere through this process, which is about the same as net primary productivity from plants. The term soil respiration encompasses two distinct processes. The first is rhizosphere respiration. This includes plant root respiration and heterotrophic respiration from the metabolism of rhizodeposits like root exudates and fine root matter. The carbon source for this rhizosphere respiration is carbon that has been recently fixed through photosynthesis, so we often think of this as plant or autotrophic respiration. The second process is microbial decomposition of soil organic matter. Soil organic matter decomposition is primarily a function of soil heterotrophic activities using soil carbon rather than carbon coming directly from plant roots in the rhizosphere. When we measure CO2 coming from the soil, we are capturing both processes as a single flux, which we refer to as soil CO2 efflux. It is important to note that in calcareous soils, the weathering of carbonates produces CO2. In those cases, this inorganic source will also contribute to the total soil CO2 efflux. Soil CO2 efflux is a physical process. It's driven primarily by the CO2 concentration gradient between the upper soil layers and the atmosphere near the soil surface. The main challenge in making accurate measurements is to minimize disturbances that might impact CO2 production and transport within the soil, like changing air pressure, for example. So we want to measure CO2 efflux without changing the environmental and physical conditions that control it. Today, we will learn how a closed dynamic measurement system works, and we will go to a long-term ecological research site in Kansas known as the Kanza LTER to measure soil CO2 efflux as part of an ongoing research project. The closed dynamic system that we are using today is just one way to measure soil CO2 efflux. In a closed system, CO2-free air is circulated from an infrared gas analyzer, or ERGA, to the chamber, where it mixes with CO2 coming from the soil and then is circulated back to the ERGA for measurement. The flux is estimated using the rate of the CO2 concentration increase inside the chamber during a short period of time. In order to make a measurement, we need a confined soil surface, which is provided by these plastic collars. Each collar is pounded into the soil so that it extends a few centimeters below the surface. This minimizes diffusion of CO2 from surrounding soil and gives us a known surface area of soil so that we can calculate a CO2 efflux on a per area basis. Besides the surface area of the soil, what other aspect of the collar do we need to measure in order to calculate our CO2 efflux? We need to measure the height of the collar from the soil, also known as the offset. This determines the volume of air we are measuring, and since we are measuring CO2 concentration, we need the volume in order to calculate an amount of CO2. To get our average offset, we measure the height of the collar at several locations and take an average. At this site, multiple collars have been installed with different treatments so that we can measure CO2 efflux on each one. The collars stay in place throughout the duration of the experiment, in this case between one and three years, to minimize soil disturbance. Now let's see the instrument take a measurement. We start by placing the chamber onto the collar, being sure that we have a tight seal. Next, we insert our temperature probe. We want to measure temperature because it is a main control on soil respiration. Now the chamber closes automatically and the measurement begins. While the ERGA is measuring, we can look at the data in real time. The instrument provides a readout of CO2 concentration, as well as other factors like temperature and humidity that help explain what we are seeing. Once the measurement is done, the chamber will open and we'll move on to the next collar. Seems pretty simple, right? There are actually a lot of considerations that went into making this measurement accurate. Most of these considerations went into the chamber design, so let's take a look at some of the elements that make this system one of the best for measuring soil CO2 efflux. Remember, CO2 leaves the soil through diffusion. The rate of diffusion depends on the concentration gradient between the soil and the air. The greater the gradient, the greater the rate of diffusion. Think about how our instrument is going to measure CO2 efflux. CO2 will build up in the chamber over time, 
and that will give us our flux. Based on what we just learned about diffusion, why might this cause an issue? The issue is that the CO2 buildup itself might slow the flux. Let's take a look at how this works. After we close the chamber, CO2 begins to build up, which is how we can take a measurement. But the increasing CO2 concentration in the chamber slows the rate of CO2 efflux. This creates a paradox, because we know that an increase in CO2 concentration in the chamber will slow the rate, but we have to build up CO2 in the chamber in order to measure that rate. These instruments use a model to overcome this problem. Here's how it works. Once the chamber closes, the computer begins recording the water-corrected chamber CO2 concentration over time. As time passes, CO2 builds up in the closed chamber and the rate levels off. Typically, this process takes only a few minutes to complete. The faster the rate of CO2 efflux, the shorter the measurement period. Using a linear regression to estimate the rate over this entire measurement period would underestimate the true rate because we know that diffusion slowed down later on. Instead, the computer uses an exponential function to estimate the rate at the beginning of our measurement when CO2 in the chamber wasn't high enough to slow diffusion. As you can see, the slope of the curve here at the beginning of our measurement time was steeper than it was here toward the end. A steeper slope means a faster rate, so by accounting for this steep slope we get a higher value for our CO2 efflux rate. This helps to prevent us from underestimating the CO2 efflux. Aside from changes in the concentration gradient, changes in pressure will also affect the rate of diffusion. So anything that affects the pressure at or near the soil surface will affect our measurement of CO2. Can you think of anything that might cause a pressure change near the soil surface? Wind is a great example. Wind blowing across the soil surface can create negative pressure there drawing CO2 out of the soil at a faster rate than if the air was still. This same thing can happen while our chamber is working. Wind can pull air through the small vent at the top of the chamber, creating a pressure gradient that pulls air from the soil surface and increases the rate of diffusion. In order to minimize this effect, our instrument has a patented pressure vent that helps maintain a constant pressure inside the chamber that matches the atmosphere outside. The closing of the chamber at the beginning of the measurement can also cause pressure changes. When the chamber comes down, it usually causes a puff of CO2 to leave the soil. Since the measurement begins as soon as the chamber closes, we must adjust our estimate of CO2 efflux, making sure we account for the initial disturbance caused by the chamber closing. We call this the dead band, and it is usually set to 20 seconds. When we calculate our CO2 efflux rate, we use the data from the end of the dead band to the end of our measurement period. Now that we've got a measurement of CO2 from our instrument, what do we do with it? The instrument is calculating the rate of change in CO2 as a mole fraction, like this. When it does this, it assumes that the volume of air we are measuring is the same as the volume of the chamber, but we have that extra space created by the collar that we have to account for. Remember when we measured the surface area and offset of our collars? We'll use those measurements now to calculate the volume of the collar and then our total volume of air. Once we have our total volume, we are ready to calculate our CO2 flux. How is this done? The equation looks like this. Fc is our soil CO2 flux that we are going to calculate. V is the total volume that we just calculated in the last step. P0 is the initial pressure, which our instrument measured. R is the gas constant, and S is our surface area of our collar that we measured before. T0 is our initial temperature, which we measured using our temperature probe. And DC over DT is the initial rate of change in the CO2 mole fraction, which is what our instrument measured. When we substitute our values, it looks like this. We have our total volume, our initial pressure, the gas constant, our surface area, the initial temperature, and finally our CO2 measurement. Let's start by canceling our units. Which gives us this. We can further simplify the centimeters and liters by converting each of them to meters. One centimeter is equal to 10 to the negative two meters, 
and one liter is equal to 10 to the negative three meters cubed. Now we can cancel those terms. and do the math. And we get our CO2 flux in micromoles per meter squared per second. Then, converting back to centimeters squared gives us a more manageable number. This calculation can be repeated for every measurement that we take, as long as we measure and account for the different offset on each of our collars. An easy way to do this is in a spreadsheet like this one. We have all of the measurements taken by our instrument and the offset of each collar here. We can then correct for each offset and calculate our actual flux here. That's all for today's lab. To recap, we got an introduction to the closed dynamic chamber measurement system. We also had a discussion of some of the limitations of chambers and ways that we overcome those limitations. Finally, we learned how to calculate CO2 flux once we have our measurements. 